Okay, so there are three types of transmission of infectious disease. And if a disease is transmitted in one of these ways, it does not necessarily mean it can't also be transmitted in another way, meaning sometimes, often, um, an infectious disease can be transmitted in multiple ways. But we do try to put terms to the different ways that the disease can be passed. One is direct contact. We call contact transmission, so shaking someone's hand if they coughed or sneezed into their hand, or if you use the same doorknob, that's called a fomite, that somebody else also touched. And then you would have to typically then you would have it on your hand and then somehow it would have to get into one of the portals because your hand is not a portal of entry. And so just shaking someone's hand doesn't do the, you know, actually cause you to be infected. It causes you to be contaminated. And then somehow from that point, it has to get into one of your portals of entry. Now, vehicle transmission, Usually, honestly, some of these things may seem actually kind of similar. Airborne sneezing. So if you sneeze into the air and someone breathes it in, then, like the picture shows at the, at the bottom left, all right, then you can be infected because that would take it into your mouth or nose. It can get into your portal of entry that way. If something's in the water, like if there's fecal material that's contaminated with a pathogen, then you can eat something or drink something that has that water, then it can get into your body. And then something on food. So on the picture on the left, excuse me, the picture on the right bottom, let's say that, you know, in this kind of open kind of meat market, there could be contamination. Now there can be contamination that's foodborne even under the most, you know, strictly um, governed food processing factories that can happen, but it's more likely when you have something that's not regulated where it's kind of just an open air market, maybe in a rural area, um, there can be things that can be transmitted there too. Um, and then vectors, we mentioned these before. That's a vector would be when usually an animal, an arthropod, can carry a little bit of an infectious agent from one individual to another through a bite. So it's in the saliva of that arthropod or it's in the the blood that's already in that body from the other person, and then it bites you and it delivers it to you directly. And by creating the bite, it's creating a portal of entry. So not only does it carry the infectious agent, but it also creates, it delivers it directly into the body instead of um, just getting you contaminated, it actually gets it into your body. So it's a little more um, direct in that sense. All right, so there are different ways that we can classify a disease. And one disease could be classified into several different categories depending on what aspect of the disease you're focusing on. So you can have a respiratory disease, that would be the first one, the body system, or you can have a cardiac disease, or you can have a urinary tract disease. You can have diseases that are named or, or classified based on what, what organ system, what body system they affect. You can have, you can classify diseases based on taxonomy. You know, is it a virus? Is it a protozoan? Often the category of what the organism that's causing the disease. You can categorize diseases by longevity and severity. So we use words like chronic or acute, and then severity. Um, we, we can um, 
classify diseases with those kinds of terms. We can classify diseases by how they're spread. So things that are zoonoses are only spread from animals to human, not from human to human. We talk about or diseases that are spread by vectors. So the, that can become a classification. And really these are like descriptions, different ways of, of classifying or describing different aspects of a disease and what's the effect they have on a population. So is it, you know, an epidemic? Is it sporadic? Those kinds of epidemiological terminology we can use. So we're going to look at some of these things in a little more detail. Here's some of the words that I was using. So acute or chronic, you do need to know these words. Acute would be a disease that pops up quickly, develops rapidly, and then runs its course and it's over. A chronic disease goes on and on and on and on. All right, and then subacute just means something in between. An asymptomatic disease. Honestly, I always debate whether this, is, this term even makes sense because it's not really a disease if you don't have any symptoms because the disease, hmm, if there's nothing going wrong in the body, then is it really a disease? It can be an infection, but anyway, they use this term, asymptomatic disease. Um, but anyway, that refers to somebody who doesn't seem to have anything going wrong with them, but maybe they have a virus or something that is reproducing in their body. Latent, you'll remember in chapter 13 with viruses, they can become dormant and then reappear. So a latent disease would be something that appears long after the initial infection. Communicable would be where you could have like transmission from human to human. Contagious, that refers to how easily it's spread. So something can be communicable, but maybe it doesn't spread that easily from one person to another. And what I mean by easily, um, sometimes you have to have a certain amount of body fluid or a certain amount of sneeze to hit the other person to really create the infection or to create the significant amount of contamination. So some things are communicable, but they're not super contagious. But a lot of things are, are highly communicable and highly contagious. So it just depends on the disease. Non-communicable disease, that would be like some of those zoonoses that go from animal to human only. They're not passed from person to person directly. Local infection, that would be just like you have a little spot um, of infection, but it's not gotten into the larger portion of your body. So localized or local. Systemic means something that's moving through your whole body. Usually it means it's going through your blood system or your lymphatic system. So that's much, much more dangerous, typically something that's systemic. Focal infection. Um, that's where you have like a really bad infection in one spot and then it's sort of creating or seeding, S-E-E-D, seeding new infections at other places, although that would kind of overlap a little bit with systemic in a lot of cases. Primary infection would be what we typically would would be anything, the first thing that you get. Secondary infection would be like the opportunistic or what we sometimes call the super infection that happens um, after you take a whole bunch of antibiotics or something like that. So make sure you familiarize yourself with these terms. All right, epidemiology. We've all had a little bit of a crash course in epidemiology and um, virology, the study of viruses because of the coronavirus. The um, epidemiology is a study of, in the population, like geographically, a lot of the time, when and where diseases are occurring and how they're being transmitted. And it's kind of a detective 
situation because you're looking at data clinics are reporting when they have cases that are diagnosed of certain diseases and you're looking to see if there are patterns um, are there places where there's a lot of this one disease and what does that mean so there's a lot of I would call it detective work that goes on in this field so you can be an epidemiologist one of my best friends she was going to go to med school, but then she ended up going to grad school, and she's an epidemiologist. So you can, this is a job, and right now, um, as I'm recording this, we're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, it becomes a very important job, and they're working very hard. Now, we have two terms, morbidity and mortality. T technically, I know the word morbid, sounds like it would mean death, but actually morbidity is the rate of infection, the rate of cases of a disease. So the percentage or proportion of the population that's infected or that's, that actually, it's hard to tell how many are infected, but who has actually, how many individuals have actually been diagnosed by a doctor and that doctor reported that number to the health agencies. So that's number of cases. Mortality is deaths. We typically assume the morbidity level is higher than whatever's reported because a lot of people get mild or asymptomatic cases of things and they never go to the doctor. You've probably had plenty of things where you felt bad for a day or two, you stayed home, or maybe you didn't, but then it, it passed. You never went to the doctor. You never had specific tests done. We just don't do that. And so, honestly, we, we really underestimate. We don't know the full number, the full amount of morbidity. So morbidity is always an underestimate of what is really happening. It's Morbidity is just based on the numbers. Um, the, the reported morbidity it can only be based on what doctors are reporting. But we know lots of people will stay home with something and never have it actually diagnosed. So that's that's a given. Now mortality, your the the death rate is usually going to be much more accurate. Um, typically, if somebody gets to that point, they are going to call an ambulance and go to the hospital and have a, a diagnosis. I would say the mortality rate could be slightly lower than the real mortality rate for a disease, but not by much. So mortality is probably going to be a much more accurate number in terms of what we actually know, but morbidity, the numbers that we would report would always be lower than what they really are in the society because people just don't go to the doctor for every, every time they feel bad. So where do you go to get this kind of information? You go to the CDC, cdc.gov, and they have what's called the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, MMWR. And this is a picture from it, but anyway. I would say the CDC website, it's a little tricky to find this actual report. You can find lots of information, but in terms of getting to this actual report, it's, you have to know what to click on their website. But anyway, the data is there. Um, and this is based on what doctors in these in these states have reported in to their health, um, their government health offices. So every county has a, a health, um, a health um, office. Um, and so you have to report to your county, and then they report to the state, and then they report to the, the CDC. So um, this is what's been reported. So number of people who came into the doctor's office in that state and, and were diagnosed with this disease, or number of individuals who died from this disease. So they, this is just one page. They have, you know, at the top you can see on this page, it's um, giardiasis, gonorrhea, hemophilia influenzae. So um, three different microbes that can cause disease. But there's, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds. But anyway, it gives you an idea of what the data looks like. 
Okay, so like I've been saying, if you look at the bottom of this image, you don't have to memorize this list, but right down here it says diseases for which hospitals, physicians, and other healthcare workers are required to report diagnosed cases to state health departments and to the CDC. So this is the list. I'm sure they update this all the time. But this would be an example of the list. So if you're working in one of those, if you're working in a doctor's office uh, or a hospital, you have to report how many cases of these things you have. And I'm sure there's a, there's a way that it's done, but it's a weekly um, report system. And then you can look at the data in lots of different ways. So epidemiologists report their data in a variety of ways. So, you know, this chart here is one way, but we can do a more visual way. One thing you got to pay attention to is how the chart, what the legend is on the chart or on the map or what the axis is labeled. So this axis is labeled number of deaths straight up number. Well, sometimes these maps are done by just straight up number. Well, of course, if you just calculate the number of deaths in Texas versus the number of deaths in North Dakota, well, shoot, there's a lot more people in Texas than North Dakota. So obviously it would be normal for us to have more deaths for any disease than North Dakota. So you got to pay attention. This one says cases per 100,000. So that means they're normalizing it for every 100,000. So then it's easier to make a state-by-state -state comparison. But when it's just plain numbers, it's really hard to, um, you know, sometimes you have to know then what the demo uh, demographics are in that population. So this is percentage, and they don't even, it could be any disease. You know, you're seeing a peak in cases in September. And so epidemiologists look at the data and try to figure out if they don't know what's causing the problem or why is it spreading in this particular way or why is it in this particular state or is it in this particular demographic age group. But you have to pay attention to what the legend is or what the axes are. Because I've noticed on the coronavirus data, they're doing number of deaths, just plain number of deaths. And, you know, Texas has a lot of people, so we've had a reasonable number of deaths. But compared to how many people are in the state, it's it was, right now it's reasonably low compared to some of the other states. But we're still getting kind of a darker shading on the, on the coronavirus data. Anyway, not this picture, but on the coronavirus data because we just have more people. So it makes sense that we would have more deaths numerically, but in terms of percentage of our population, it's actually not as, as um, heavy in our state as it is in some other states. So, But this is not a coronavirus map, so I just want to make sure you notice that. This, this maps, this book, most of their data is 2015, but it's just an example of what the data would look like. So maps, graphs, a lot of bar graphs and such. All right, terminology for diseases that affect large geographic areas. So you have four terms, endemic, sporadic, epidemic, pandemic. In this diagram, the pink shading, I guess it's pink or orange, indicates where the disease would normally be found, you know. And so in, in the first, in part A, this is endemic, meaning you have some cases kind of in the normal places where it's normally found, but you don't have any particular area where there's a whole bunch of cases. So that's endemic. So there's a lot of diseases, diseases that are endemic, you know. You know, they're, they're there, they come around a certain time of year maybe, but it's considered normal. As long as there's not too many cases in one spot, they just consider that kind of the, the baseline or the normal. Now, sporadic, you'll notice the difference here is this, these continents are not shaded. So they're indicating that this would not be a normal place for these diseases, but you have a few cases. 
usually what this means is somebody traveled and brought it back. They got it somewhere else in the world, they brought it back, and then they started showing symptoms. As long as that doesn't start to spread, then, you know, the doctors will keep an eye on that. But um, that's called sporadic. It's, it's an occasional case of something unusual in a place where it normally doesn't appear. And that's usually the result of somebody traveling to an area where it does usually appear and then coming back to their home and then starting to show those symptoms. Epidemic is where you have something that is typical in that place. Actually, it wouldn't really matter whether it's normal range or not normal range because you could have a whole bunch of cases in one place. But really, you can kind of draw a border around that one place. That might be a large border, but you can kind of draw a line around it. That's an epidemic. And if anyone, by the way, if one of these cases in the sporadic started spreading, it could be an epidemic. So epidemic just means a whole bunch of cases of something in one place. And it doesn't have to be shaded pink. It doesn't have to be the normal range of the disease. Could be, might not be. But a whole bunch of cases in one place. And that's where epidemiologists start to try to figure out what's going on. And then pandemic is like epidemic, but multiple epidemics all over the place. So widespread epidemics, that then we just call it pandemic. It's like a, a huge epidemic of multiple locations. So that's, that's where we are with the coronavirus. But I will tell you, it started off as sporadic over here in the United States, um, and then it became pandemic. So each of these individuals who traveled back from um, Asia, you know, brought it back. Now, I don't blame Asia at all. This could have happened the other way. It could have started in the Americas, and then people traveled over to Asia, and then they could have gotten it after. So it's just the way it happened this time. But um, now we're in this pandemic situation. So the place that you want to go to get your information, honestly, you want to go straight to the source. They're not always right, but they're more right than anybody else. So they have at least the best information that anyone has at the moment. So when something is happening, you, you know, right at first, there's, you know, sometimes the information is incomplete, is what I would call it. And then people who aren't in the CDC or the World Health Organization might interpret it wrongly. Maybe even occasionally these groups interpret it wrongly, but this is your best chance of getting the best information um, early. So this is where I would recommend you go. Now, what do the public health agencies do? We've seen a great example of this. So Clay Jenkins got on TV, because he's um, Dallas County, um, and he announced that we were gonna isolate and quarantine all right, so this is where your, your county public health agency has a way of shutting things down, putting money, federal money into, or state money in this case, into um, whatever needs to happen. All right, and you can bet Clay Jenkins is listening to the experts. So Dallas County did a good job shutting things down earlier than a lot of other counties. Um, and I was actually pretty, pretty happy with that because I've seen um, some people not have as strong leadership. Uh, some, some states, some counties. Um, you can't wait for people to get sick by the time people start showing the symptoms, it's too late. So I really think they acted. Of course, you, you can always, in hindsight, look back and say, we could have done this faster, we could have done this more, but I was pretty pretty happy. I was pretty happy with, I was, I was really happy with the way Dallas County Community College 
shut down very early. Um, and so I really appreciate that leadership. Um, it's hard to do. It's been hard on everybody. And, um, but I think it's really going to make a difference for us in ways that we won't know because we'll, we will have diverted or avoided um, a certain amount of, of disease and we'll never know how much, but I think, I think we, we've done a good job. Uh, all right, and then in the hospital, you have a special concern. There are what we call healthcare associated infections or nosocomial infections. And nosocomial infections, that just means that means the same thing, healthcare associated. It's where when you're in a hospital or you're in a clinic situation, you tend to have sick people, so immunocompromised patients. You have staff and um, doctors and nurses and, and all kinds of staff that are moving between patients and they're also moving equipment and things between patients. And you have a higher level of microorganisms in that general environment because some of the people are sick with something communicable. So you might have, you know, cancer, somebody undergoing cancer treatment, they're immunocompromised, but you have somebody, you know, down the hall who has something that is infectious. So it it's just kind of a, a kind of a perfect storm and that term is used when some a whole bunch of bad situate a whole bunch of um, conditions come together for something bad to happen it's called the perfect storm which um, it's just a term so you have kind of a perfect storm where you can have the spread of something go quickly in a hospital. And I think you can understand that. Um, a lot of you have clinical experience for sure. So the hospital or the clinic is gonna have policies of what you have to do every time you go into a, a patient room, every time you leave a patient room, and every time you handle a patient sample, those types of things, and that's, that's why. Well, and plus to protect you, to protect the, the other patients too. 